Lord, uh, give us a blessing tonight as we uh, are glad, Lord, to be able to assemble in this fashion. Thank you, Father, for uh, the ones that you have kept here, protected in so many wonderful ways. Thank you for our salvation, Lord, that indeed, no matter what happens to us physically, we have a home prepared in heaven. So we ask your blessing here tonight as the, uh, with the offering. Continue, Lord, to meet our needs according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tenderest gift in thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy faults prepare, blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine, we are. We are thine, do thou be free. Sin defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear or oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus. Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear or oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast brought us thine we So we're back to uh, the infallible proofs, and we're going to take up uh, some study here tonight, a bit technical study, but uh, we got to cut short this morning, didn't we? So here, we're going to talk about the historicity of the Bible, just a big word that means the historical evidence that the Bible is true. So that when the Bible speaks historically, it speaks accurately. Uh, so it's suggested by some Bible minimalists that the Bible is not to be taken in any kind of literal fashion and certainly should not be required to uh, meet any historical accuracy standards. So, um, and this uh, battle has been going on for centuries, by the way. It's nothing new. It comes in different forms. I mentioned this morning, uh, this smart Alec uh, has a PhD at the University of Michigan, but he says there was no Moses. So that ends all debate. I mean, he just said there is no Moses uh, and there's no crossing of the sea, no revelation on Mount Sinai. Uh, and, so uh, and so since he has a PhD, we just, and he's a distinguished uh, term professor, so I mean, we'd, we'd have to say, well, it ends all debate right there. And, uh, but uh, uh, these are windbags to be ignored, and most of them are highly um, arrogant in their positions, as we saw this morning, a little bit of that. Uh, so. 
I want to play just again a kind of a repeat of that clip of the Bible expert that was uh, being interviewed here. Uh, she had read the Bible and studies the Bible. I mean, she's, I don't think she's all of 30 years of age, but she is, she knows everything and she knows the Bible isn't to be trusted. As somebody who's studied it again and again, back to front, is it fact? Is anything in there historical fact? Uh, very little, probably. Um, I think one important thing to bear in mind is that ancient writers had a very different understanding of what fact or fiction was from, from us today. Um, it wasn't written to be a factual account of the past. I don't think that's the way in which these biblical writers understood the past. Um, but as a historian of, of the Bible, I think there's very little that's factual. King David? No. no. Moses? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said Jesus behind me. I don't think it, they were taking the Lord's name in vain. No, Jesus. Um, most scholars would agree that he existed, yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, <laughs> we're, glad, we're glad that she admits that Jesus at least existed. Um, there's too much uh, corroborating evidence on that one. I guess she couldn't deny it. But here we have an expert, age 30 or whatever she is. She's you know, had a lot of life experience, obviously. And the Bible to her is just fable. It's myth. It's being uh, dismissed. We're not supposed to uh, believe the Bible is being historically accurate. And so uh, and programs like this influence minds that don't know any better. And so uh, they listen to that. And of course, they see that she's credentialed and that she's the head of a his history department at a university. And so to a lot of people, they cower from that and figure, well, they, they know more than I know. And that's uh, pretty pathetic, as a matter of fact. So, so that's what we're kind of up against. Uh, so what we need to do, I suppose what, what's important for us to do at times is to just trust that what God says is true rather than going into some kind of detailed uh, polemic and arguing her position and so forth. Let her believe what she wants to and uh, we'll believe what we want to. But at the, the end, of course, uh, when she has to stand before Almighty God and explain herself, uh, I wouldn't want to be in her shoes, I can tell you that right now. So, uh, was there a Moses and was there a Red Sea crossing? So, uh, remember this morning I mentioned to you that archaeology, uh, it's not a kind, of, kind of a pure science in the sense of um, even archaeologists admit themselves that discovery, that it's 10% discovery and 90% interpretation. So they may find something, dig some kind of artifact, hold it up and say, this is what it is, or this is when it was. And they'll, they'll say it with great authority. And um, we have to remember at all times, well, what you have in your hand and so forth, and what, what you think is evidence. And it can work the other way as well. Uh, if God wanted to, he could have saved Noah's Ark and preserved it somewhere on a mountain and we could have found it and the, that would maybe give us great relief and we could point to that and that would end all skeptical debate. But don't, don't count on it. It wouldn't happen. They'd figure something out uh, to deny it. And the same with the Red Sea crossing. So uh, he, he could have left artifacts for us to dig up later and, and to prove that the Bible is true. But you notice that God doesn't do these things intentionally. Uh, for instance, at the resurrection of Jesus, there were over 500 witnesses that 1 Corinthians 15 records. But they were not hostile witnesses. There's a sense in which he appeared to his disciples, those that already believed him, those that already trusted him. Uh, so I could argue, well, why not appear to the hostile witness? Why not appear to Pontius Pilate, for instance? Or, or better than that, why not appear to, uh, to uh, Tiberius Caesar? That would uh, end all debate, wouldn't it? But you see that God does not do things like this, intentionally so, because he's placed some of this in the realm of faith that you and I are going to have to trust without having those kind of concrete evidential uh, pieces of information, be it archaeological, historical, or, or whatever. That said, there are some interesting things that have been uncovered and found. Uh, and of course, everything that is ever found that a, a, a biblicist would point to and say, this is evidence, then on the other side of the argument, they'll, uh, they'll debunk it. And so you can count on the fact, especially some of the findings in the, in the Red Sea that we have, uh, it's been soundly debunked by the other side, the unbelieving side. Uh, and that should be, come as no surprise to any of us. 
Was there a Red Sea crossing? The scattered formations on the Saudi side of Aqaba resemble those previously found off the Nueva Peninsula. In the midst of them, Pan Chien photographed this circular object attached to what appears to have been a broken axle or hub. This discovery was significant for two reasons. Pan Tien had documented the coral encrusted form of a wheel with dimensions similar to ancient Egyptian artifacts directly across from the proposed Nueva crossing site. Her find also provided independent confirmation of earlier evidence establishing wheel-like formations on both coasts of the Red Sea in accordance with descriptions in the biblical record. And the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army, and he made the wheels of their chariots come off. While Egyptian environmental laws prohibit removal of any coral for scientific dating and analysis, photographic evidence may provide a link to the time of the exodus. Scholars have recognized that the design of the chariot wheel can be used to identify specific periods in Egyptian history. In the waters of Aqaba, it appears that remnants of four and six spoke wheels have been discovered. These designs were used simultaneously only during Egypt's 18th dynasty and no later than about 1400 BC a time frame that coincides closely to the biblical date of the Exodus. There's much more to this, but I, that's, that's just one interesting um, position, point of view. Of course, they, they actually went down with metal detectors uh, because, again, this is all coral encrusted, so um, it, it might just be a matter of interpretation of what you think it is and what it seems to appear to be. But um, the metal detector indicates that there's uh, metallic substance inside that coral. So where did that come from? Uh, so let's just call it um, a compelling evidence, not necessarily convincing evidence. Uh, I don't need a wheel chariot, a chariot or a chariot wheel found in the Red Sea uh, to buttress my faith, and nor should you. We're not depending on these things. But it becomes an interesting and intriguing uh, concept if, in fact, that's what is at the bottom of the Red Sea. It's what we would expect to be there, as a matter of fact, because the Bible already told us what happened. Something I think a little more concrete. Uh, and you, you remember the um, uh, Dr. Francesca there, she uh, uh, when asked if David was a real king, uh, but no, sorry, uh, just a myth. There was no King David. And there's a large school of uh, skeptics that believe that there was never a King David. And, uh, and yet we have this, what's called the Tel Dan uh, steel, a steel here, S-T-E-L-E. -E. Uh, the, these are monuments uh, that were made historical monuments, uh, very much like a, uh, well, if you go to the center of a lot of uh, towns, and you'll find uh, that they put up a, a plaque to the World War I or World War II veterans or s something of that nature. In, in a sense, that's a steel, uh, a monument that would be uh, chiseled and so forth. Or if you go to a cemetery and you can see grave markers, those are steels, or that's a way of explaining the word itself. So this is the tell, which means they, that where they dug the Tel Dan steel uh, that they found, specifically nations, uh, sp specifically mentions ancient kings such as David and ancient battles such as the wars with Sennacherib. The broken and fragmentary inscription commemorates the victory of an Armenian, uh, Armenian uh, king over his two southern neighbors, the kings of Israel and the king of the house of David. In the... Uh, in the carefully incised text, now you, again, you can't see it here, and it had to be deciphered to some degree, but you have the expression from the house of David. Um, and neat Aramaic uh, characters, the uh, Aramean king boasts that he, under the divine guidance of the god Hadad, vanquished several thousand Israelite and Judahites 
horsemen and charioteers before personally dispatching both of his royal opponents. This becomes hard evidence uh, to the life of, of David for those that would doubt if there ever was a King David. And uh, there are many other things we could cite. I'm just giving you kind of some highlights here. This is taken from uh, Herodotus, who was a uh, historian. Uh, and uh, this is his uh, history on uh, chapter 1 and line 181, where it says, uh, it gives us an account of the Medes and the Persian invasion that took Belshazzar's life. This is all, of course, recorded in the book of Daniel for us. Uh, with all the details that we would need, but again, it corroborates with what we call uh, secular history. So this is the history written by people that are adversarial in a sense, uh, hostile witnesses they're called, only not because they're angry or whatever like uh, Dawkins, you know, but hostile in the sense of they're not Christians, they're not uh, theists. Uh, so when they're writing, they're not writing uh, to defend the faith. They're just writing details, and they corroborate the details of the scripture. And in this case, Herodotus writes of the Medes and the Persian invasion that took place under uh, Belshazzar's life. He wrote that uh, Darius and Cyrus came in control of the city while the Babylonians were dancing and making merry by the diverting of the uh, Euphrates. So that, that certainly corresponds exactly with what we found there in the book of Daniel. In the uh, Cyropedia, uh, Xenophon, who was also a historian, uh, reports uh, the same story that the Persians uh, chose to attack knowing that a certain festival was going to occur when all Babylon was accustomed to drink and revelry uh, all night long. A king uh, did die in the palace night of the fall of Babylon. So again, this completely coincides with what Daniel wrote. Again, this would be what we consider a hostile witness He's not trying to defend the faith in any fashion. He's laying forth history as he, as he knew it and understood it at that particular time. So Dr. William Shea, who is a Christian, was determined that uh, Necritus was the mother of Belshazzar, who was probably the uh, queen who insisted that Belshazzar call on Daniel for the translation of the writing on the wall. A source of such information is from Herodotus' history which says that she was the last great queen of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. They also have this very intriguing prophecy in Isaiah where Cyrus the Great is actually named 120 years before he was born. Uh, so it's Isaiah 44, 28 that's, uh, that uh, saith of, uh, of Cyrus, this word of course in the Hebrew is Koresh, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure even uh, saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And thus saith the Lord in his, uh, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked pla places straight. I will break it in pieces, the gates of brass, and uh, bring us under the bars, uh, break us under the bars of iron. And also here, later on uh, in the same passage, and I will give thee treasures of darkness, hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord. And there is none else. There is no God beside me. Uh, I girded thee, though uh, thou hast not known me. So uh, we know that Cyrus, uh, he was a worshiper of pagan gods and gave the credit to uh, Marduk and the, the gods, the Babylonian and, and uh, Syrian gods, rather than credit to the Lord Jehovah. Nonetheless, it, it is clear that he, uh, he gave permission for what's considered to be, you know, kind of an amazing moment in human history where a, a, a tyrant like Cyrus the Great would come in and actually uh, inculcate the concept of freedom of religion. And so he didn't take the religion away from the people that he conquered. And uh, that is made clear on what's called the uh, Cyrus Cylinder, which is an actual artifact that has been uncovered with the writings, uh, kind of a chronicle of the works of Cyrus. 
Uh, and it corresponds with this passage. It's in 2 Chronicles 36. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people. The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Now that's not on the Cyrus cylinder. What's on the Cyrus cylinder is uh, this expression. The gods who dwelt there, I returned to their home and let them move into an eternal dwelling. All their people I collected and brought them back to their homes. So that is line 32 on the Cyrus cylinder, completely corroborating what we just read in Second Chronicles as to God actually uh, giving us even more information about what was in the heart of Cyrus the Great. So uh, we find that amazing, uh, that, and God knowing Cyrus before he was even born and naming him in that fashion is amazing. Uh, just to give you some timeline, so this is where the prophets kind of fit into uh, the picture. And Wednesday night we were talking about uh, God who had sundry times in a diverse manner spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And uh, so these prophets, of course, messengers from the Lord, some of them verbal prophet, prophets, but uh, these in this case are all written prophets. So they actually write down the words of God and uh, deliver them to us. And each one of them... Uh, uh, records at the various times that they were living and the rulers that were involved and the enemies that were involved and the nations that were involved and all of this completely corresponds with what secular history tells us as well. Now we have this amazing passage in Daniel, Daniel uh, really one of the major prophets and he gives us a, a picture not just of what was happening in the immediate but also what was going to happen in the future and that's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. God gave the king a dream in which he contrasted the temporary kingdoms of men with the eternal kingdom of God. Nebuchadnezzar saw a mammoth image. Its head was made of gold, representing Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Its chest and arms, silver, symbolizing the dual kingdom of the Medes and Persians that would follow. Its belly and thighs of bronze, the Greco-Macedonian Empire of Alexander the Great. Its legs of iron, the Roman Empire. And its feet, partly of iron, partly of clay. At the end time, a rock issued out of heaven made without hands and struck the image, breaking it into pieces. The rock then grew into a great mountain that filled the whole earth, which represents the kingdom of God established by Jesus Christ, built on the ruins of humanity's empire. So this was a uh, prophetic picture of what the history that would follow. Now, of course, Daniel lives through at least uh, two periods of that, the ne Nebuchadnezzar's reign in Babylon, where he's taken uh, at that point as a young man, a teenager actually, and brought into Nebuchadnezzar's court, um, but sees him as the head of gold and tells him that you are the head of gold in this vision. But there are going to be other kingdoms that come that are somewhat inferior to yours thereafter. And uh, thus, he predicts the Babylonian Empire, but also predicts that ultimately it will fail. Uh, in which case then the Persians would come in, and this uh, would be Cyrus the Great. The two arms representing the Persian and Median alliance that took place historically, uh, which nobody could have known about at the time that Daniel received the vision. Uh, Cyrus the Great, and uh, you might call him one of the arms, and the other arm would have been uh, Darius the Mede. So we have the Medes and the Persians uh, that follow thereafter. So again, uh, in a sense now we have prophetical history, but it's still historically uh, quite accurate. And uh, the territories that would be involved also uh, would be seen and understood. Their following would be the uh, Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great. And then, of course, after his death, it would be divided uh, into a... Um, uh, four kings, four generals that would take control of that territory at his untimely death. And the Roman Empire with its two legs, the eastern and western portions. Uh, the western, of course, under Julius Caesar, who was then murdered by his own senators. And later in time, uh, Constantine would uh, come in about 400 years later and uh, amalgamate the east and the west under his uh, rule and reign. 
and uh, you can see here that there was no other kingdom thereafter as far as a worldwide domination uh, that would take place. The latter end, of course, uh, prophetically, would be the right revived Roman Empire, uh, which would be under the auspices of the Antichrist and the false prophet. And that would be a worldwide kingdom that would ultimately be destroyed by the coming of the Lord, who is this stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands and becomes a great uh, uh, kingdom. This is the timeline as to understanding all of that, and this history is perfectly accurate and also can be corroborated with secular history, profane history, as it were. All this leads up to the birth of Christ. I've often mentioned that as far as history is concerned, this is the apex of time. Uh, all waiting for the coming of the Messiah. He finally comes, but he's crucified, rejected by his own people. And so now he's coming again with his kingdom the second time. And so now we look back to that event, his death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, with bated breath, we uh, anticipate his return uh, during the time of tribulation, then his return to the earth and the smiting of all Gentile powers that have the dominion over the chosen people, and then his establishment of his kingdom forever. And that's, uh, that's a good way of understanding history. As I, uh, just to play on the word history, his story. History is his story. It's God's story. And the idea that, uh, you know, we have the historians now that, that uh, annex anything to do with Christ and God. In fact, they changed uh, the expression that had been used now for so long, B.C. Uh, we all knew it to be before Christ and A.D., uh, which is uh, the Latin terms for Anno Domini, which is uh, the year of the Lord. So uh, for, for any, any of us that went to school, high school and so forth, that's all that we knew. But now they changed it now to B.C.E., before the common era. They've got to take Christ out of the picture. But all of time even honors Christ. So everything comes back to his birth. And so, so we have time basically reversing at, at Christ and going the other direction. So uh, it's just unavoidable. It's ineluctable what Christ has done and who he is. They want to try to eliminate him, erase him from the history books. And this is the danger of what's happening with revisionist history in the public school systems and the colleges and so on. To take Christ out of the picture. We don't want to mention him. But I, I tell you what, it's his story. It's all about his story. All right, so back to some other archaeological finds. So we have the uh, Nabonidus, uh, who was known to be a king of the throne at the time of the medial Persian conquest of Babylon. However, in 1854, archaeologist Henry Rawlinson found an inscription while excavating an ancient Ur, which stated that Nabonidus associated with him on his throne his eldest son, Belshar Osar, and allowed him the royal title. So, of course, this name is a der uh, we have a derivation of it in the Bible, Belshazzar. And so here is his name inscribed. So for those that say, oh, no, no, it's just all made up. It's just a myth. Uh, people got in a smoke-filled room and wrote things and made up names and put them in place. But you see archaeology here is demonstrating and proving that the, these people that were actual people that lived and breathed and had position and also uh, the timeline is totally and completely accurate. So we also we already looked at Cyrus. Uh, and uh, the inscription on the cylinder. So we're kind of jumping ahead. There's, there's a lot of other evidences and so on, but that can become tedious. And the last thing I want to do is put anybody to sleep in our history class, right? So uh, we look at uh, Luke. He's a physician, so physicians, uh, well, we hope that physicians uh, give great uh, importance to detail. I don't want a surgeon coming in, you know, Dr. Larry, Dr. Moe, and Dr. Curley. I'm not interested in them operating on me. I want somebody that's going to come in that actually takes their job seriously and uh, detail. That's what uh, surgery is all about. So, uh, so Luke is a physician. So we understand, in other words, that he would have a, 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 an ordered mind and would not be given over to uh, overinflation of detail. Uh, so everything that he writes, uh, and he gives us more history than the other three writers of the gospel. Uh, and it begins in this fashion, as he begins to write, he says, For as much then as uh, I have taken in hand to set forth the order of declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, 
I mean, this is a, quite a preface. Uh, Luke, as you know, was saved apparently under Paul's ministry and actually uh, became a minister partner with Paul, went uh, with Paul to these various places. Paul sometimes would heal uh, with the gift of healing that was still extant in the first century. And Luke would use his actual gifts of healing, which were... Uh, uh, typical uh, of the time. They were, they were the various modalities that would be applied in the first century. So we see the divine and we also see the physical uh, kind of blended together and there was never a conflict between the two and shouldn't be to this day for that matter. So, um, so he speaks uh, almost apologetically. He said uh, that uh, I've received the information from those who were actual eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Uh, so it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding. Uh, again, he's a physician. He would not be given to hyperbole or exaggeration. He would say perfect understanding. We're talking about inspiration here. We're talking, uh, what else is perfect understanding of all things from the very first? To write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So uh, the reason for this series that I'm giving is that I, w I would like to establish all of you with a certain degree of certitude. You do not have to be ashamed and hang your head low and think somehow that you're uh, some kind of country bumpkin, a rube that believes in the Bible. And that's how, that's how the argument is framed in the world. You're, you're seen to be uh, something wrong with your mind. This morning's uh, uh, shocking uh, interview with Dr. Dawkins, all he is is a professor. He's, he's not really a uh, professor of biology. Nobody ever questions him. Uh, he's more, phil uh, he's more a, a doctor of philosophy. Uh, but you can see the anger in him and uh, his complete frustration with people, as he said, 40% of the American population believes that there was an Adam and Eve. He's totally frustrated with this kind of ignorance that people uh, and superstition that people cling to myths and uh, totally frustrated with it. So it's up to him and others to enlighten us and get us out of the dark ages and be enlightened like he is so that we know that when we die, we just go in the ground and rot and there's nothing more to life. That's, so that's what he has to offer. Uh, <laughs> and that's all an atheist can give you. He can't give you anything beyond this world. And for that matter, uh, of course, his expression is, uh, there, you know, there is no Bible, there is no Christ, so be good for goodness sake, whatever that means. What does that mean? Uh, so there, if there is no God, if there is no final judgment, then why be good at all? Uh, what's the motivation to be good? Uh, what's the standard of what good is if there is no Bible, if there's no moral authority? At any rate, so now in the 15th year, this is the third chapter of Luke, where he actually gives us a summation of the times. So we can kind of go back and we can check this out again from profane history. We can take what secularists wrote during that time and we can see if it meshes with what Luke is writing here. And of course it does perfectly, hand in glove. So now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being a governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee. So he even understands the tetrarchy uh, where the kingdom was divided into four at the Herod the Great dies. And so he leaves his kingdom in four sections to his four sons. So he even gives that detail here. And his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. Uh, this little bit of information we can easily ascertain from the chronicles of uh, Talmudic writing. So uh, all of this perfectly accurate history. In fact, it was, uh, he was uh, named by Sir William Ramsey as being a consummate historian. Luke is a historian of the first rank, not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed al along with the very greatest of historians. Luke is unsurpassed in respect of its trustworthiness. So uh, he spoke in, the, in that detail. Also, Philip Schaff writes in making f reference to 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands. Luke made no mistakes. The certainty of Jesus Christ is revealed by Luke is as certain as my own identity. 
And uh, when we were studying the Gospel of Luke, we actually brought all of those characters to light that uh, he spoke of. Uh, if we think of uh, the second chapter of Luke. There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, and he was the reigning Caesar at the birth of Christ uh, between 27 B.C. and 14 A.D. when he died, and then Tiberius Caesar. Uh, so we have, as Luke told us, Herod the Great, and historically, these are people that were notary, uh, notary uh, in the historical famous, famous people. So there's an easy way to check all these, these details because the annals of Roman history would have recorded their names and the times in which they reigned. Uh, we know that uh, Herod uh, the Great died in uh, 4 BC which would have meant that Jesus was born just before that. And, uh, and then uh, we mentioned the division of the Tetrarchy, where he left it to his four sons. And, as Luke also, and then, of course, Luke also gives us a detail about a governor that came in the interim and deposed uh, the weakling, uh, uh, the weakling kings, and took uh, actually uh, control of uh, Jerusalem. At that time, it became a proctorship, so that was the idea of Cyrenius coming in and uh, taking control of uh, Jerusalem. Then we have Ti uh, Tiberius in 14, and then Pontius Pilate comes in at 26 AD. Uh, all of this is easily resolved and understood uh, from a timeline. So each one of these uh, details that Luke gives us can be easily checked out, and we can find out from profane history that it's quite accurate. So, all right. So, if we just focused on the uh, apostolic age, the birth of Christ all the way to John's uh, exile on, the, on Patmos, we can see the corresponding historical events that took place and uh, secular history, in other words, kind of coinciding. But secular history and biblical history never conflict. Uh, and that's the point of our the historicity of the Bible. Now, here's another archaeological find that's uh, considered a very important one. The Moabite uh, stone was uh, discovered in 18 what 68, about 20 miles east of the Dead Sea. What is most amazing is that it mentions Israel, Yahweh, and the House of David. In the Bible, it says that Misha, the king of Moab, was paying tribute to Israel and that they suddenly stopped. Misha, king of Moab, rebelled against the king of Israel. You can read this verbatim almost in 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 5. Again, this is a very important archaeological find. And once it was deciphered, uh, then uh, it just becomes a proof that the Bible already told us that information. Uh, there is the Pilate inscription. Again, there are people that maintain that Jesus wasn't. Now, that one uh, smart aleck woman that was on here, the doctor, um, she at least realized that there's, there's no gainsaying about the life of Christ. The problem is there was too much history written. There's too much evidence from, again, hostile witnesses that Christ actually lived. So to deny Christ, I mean, that's ludicrous. But there's still, there's a group of people that still believe uh, that there, Christ never lived, that he, he never walked the earth. Uh, and that all this was just made up and fabricated, including uh, Pontius Pilate. But uh, they just recently, 1961, archaeologists discovered an inscription in uh, Caesarea. And uh, what did they find on it? Uh, Pontius Pilate, the, the prefect of Judea, just as the Bible told us in Luke chapter 2. So that's fascinating. Then, of course, they found the coffin of Matthias. Matthias was the apostle that uh, was chosen in the book of Acts in the first chapter. And um, there's evidence that this was his uh, sarcophagus. Uh, also, it could be said the tomb of Simon Barsabas in Acts chapter 1. You'll read about this. And uh, to, it's uh, inscribed here on the sarcophagus the, to Jesus the Lord. So scholars believe that this is the earliest record of Christian faith ever found. Burial cave where the stone coffin was discovered was sealed not later than 42 AD. Then um, we also have the Erastus inscription on a slab of limestone, which was uh, part of the pavement near the theater at Corinth. A Latin inscription was found, which translate Erastus in return for discipleship, laid the 
pavement at his own expense. Then, uh, of course, the denarius, which was used, uh, it had the image of Tiberius Caesar, which is a proven fact, uh, but the, it's mentioned, the denarius is mentioned in the scripture. Then we have the cave of John, thousands of shards uh, from ritual jugs, a stone used uh, for foot cleansing and wall cake carvings that tell the story of the biblical preacher of John the Baptist. We have the pool of Siloam that was just recently uncovered. Uh, this was the place, you remember, where Jesus told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. It was a mikvah uh, where they would, a public bath where you would wash yourself before you would enter into the temple. And uh, here, of course, is where Jesus instructed him to go and uh, wash off the mud from his eyes, and he suddenly saw him. Now again, back to the hostile witnesses that we have profane historians that note the life of Jesus. So that's why there's no gainsaying about Christ. As the Jews were making constant disturbance at the instigation of Crestus. Now we would, uh, that's, that basically is a, uh, a misunderstanding of the name Christ. Crestus. He expelled them from Rome. And this was Suetonius in his historical writings. Uh, also, he mentions on the great fire of Rome, he writes, punishment was inflicted on the Christians, a body of people addicted to a novel and mischievous superstition. Uh, so he was a chief secretary to Emperor Hadrian, and he confirms the report in Acts 18.2 that Claudius commanded all Jews, among them Priscilla and Aquila, to leave Rome, which happened in 49 AD. Then there's the Nazareth Decree, a slab of stone found in Nazareth in 1878 inscribed with a decree from Emperor Claudius that no graves should be disturbed or bodies extracted or moved, with the offender being sentenced to capital punishment on the charge of violation of a sepulcher. Uh, Tacitus also, uh, again, we consider a hostile witness, uh, not a believer, but he is a Roman historian, first century, and he writes, to dispel the rumor, Nero substituted uh, as culprits and treated with the most extreme punishment some people popularly known as Christians, whose disgraceful activities were notorious. The originator of that name, Christus, had been executed when Tiberius was emperor by order of the procurator Pontius Pilate. But the deadly uh, cult, though checked for time, was now breaking out again, not only in Judea, the birthplace of this evil, but even throughout Rome, where all the nasty and disgusting ideas from all over the world pour in and find a ready following. So, so uh, he is indeed a hostile witness in the truest sense of the word. Nonetheless, this all validates the fact that these are people that live contemporaneous at the time of Christ, or very near to it, and uh, uh, these details all corroborate with what the scripture already said. Also, the fact that crucifixion was used. Uh, again, we could go to uh, Josephus, but uh, he's considered to be, since he's a Jewish historian, uh, he's considered at least to be a theist. Nonetheless, the concept of crucifixion uh, people that deny Christ even deny that there was such a uh, torture as crucifixion. And uh, of course they found, have found since then, crucified feet and crucified hands, uh, which all date back to the first century. Pliny the Younger also is a Roman author and administrator in a letter to Emperor Trajan about 112 AD, Pliny describes the early Christian worship practices. So they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God, and bound themselves by solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up after which it was their custom to separate uh, and them then uh, reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Uh, so he's less hostile towards the Christians. It was recognized by some that the Christians were actually good citizens to Rome and uh, shouldn't have been persecuted as they were. Uh, they, they recently, in 1986, they found this uh, they call it the Jesus boat, but they found it in the Sea of Galilee and uh, 
and dredged it up. I mean, it was during a, a drought season and they actually saw uh, a, a part of the, uh, the boat uncovered and so they, uh, they brought it up rather uh, meticulously, reassembled it, uh, some parts of it. Uh, all of this indicates that they did have fishing boats at that time and just as the account in the uh, Gospels tell us, enough room here to actually fit 13 people. Uh, Trajan himself, in reply to Pliny's letter, gave the following guidelines for punishing Christians. No search should be made for these people when they are denounced and found guilty, they must be punished. With the restriction, however, that when the parties deny himself to be a Christian and shall give proof that he is not, that is, by adoring our gods, he shall be pardoned on the ground of repentance, even though he may have formally incurred suspicion. So we, we understand that the Christians were becoming a problem uh, to uh, the Roman Empire. To the emperor uh, considered him, them to even be a threat, as did Nero. And again, remember that we're still in the first century, and uh, even at the time that the Apostle John may have still been alive. They also uncovered the ossuary of James. So uh, this is 2,000 year old, a box that held bones and bears the inscription, James the son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. So the script is consistent with the date in the middle of the first century AD. Uh, and that, that's how they, when they uncovered these things and they found them, it's uh, again, nothing more than evidence. We also have uh, almost hostile witness in the Talmudic writings. So on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, which is uh, just a form of Jesus, Yeshua, uh, was hanged for 40 days before the execution took place. A, a herald went forth and cried, he is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel in apostasy. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of the Passover. So again, this coming from not just Talmudic writing, but also Babylonian Talmudic writing, it was information that they were privy to at that particular time when they were compiling the Talmud in uh, 70 AD. Uh, and the high priest Caiaphas, his ossuary was also found, uh, which indicated uh, again that he was a, a living, breathing person. We have this uh, quotation, and it's been debunked by uh, those who hate to admit that there'd be any kind of evidence for the life of Christ, especially from uh, one as noted a historian as Josephus. But Josephus says, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both uh, many Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophecies had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. The reason, uh, of course, now uh, there are those that will argue that this was inserted by Christians uh, to give some kind of flavor of authority to uh, by putting it in the text of Josephus because Josephus was known to be an extremely accurate historian. Um, but uh, when we get, try to go back to the first century, uh, when all of this would have happened, uh, how do you prove it or disprove it? And so just by laying out the doubt, that's enough for skeptics to say, well, he never wrote that. That was just added later, and that's what you basically hear as the argument against it. Nonetheless, there it is, and I uh, believe what you want. Uh, so uh, we, they also discovered the synagogue at Capernaum in Luke chapter 4, it's the very synagogue that Jesus went in the synagogue and the, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. So uh, he performed uh, a, an exorcism right here in the, this uncovered archeological uh, remain. Uh, they've also claimed to find, well, we'll say the garden tomb. I don't think that they found the, the actual tomb of Jesus. Nobody knows which one it was. What they did find though are tombs or sepulchers like this in a garden setting, and so that uh, it's similar to what the account in John tells us. 
Uh, they certainly did find the amphitheater at Ephesus, that's uh, one of the famous archaeological finds, and uh, it's in a rather uh, amazing good condition. And this was the place where you might recall that Paul, they wanted to tear him limb to limb, from limb from limb. So, history, whose story? Uh, at the end, we have to say uh, it is indeed his story, even though the great usurper tries to take that away. So, uh, what is it all about? Well, it's uh, historical uh, rejectors of Christ uh, believe that man is the measure of all things. And so they, they portray man as being the center of history. Uh, he's the uberman or the superman. And uh, that was Greek thinking. When you look at history, any kind of history, you understand that all history has a point of view. This is something we all need to be reminded about. For instance, listening to newscasts. Uh, there's no such thing as an unbiased reporter. They pretend to be that, but they really aren't. They have a point of view. And that point of view sometimes is rather subtle. And I, you could say this on both sides, by the way. So, so people that tune into Fox, they, they have an agenda. Their agenda is whatever the left is saying, they say the opposite. Uh, so, so you have to be careful about what you're listening to as far as what truth is, okay, because uh, and it's all about ratings, <laughs> sadly. But everybody has a point of view, and I have a point of view, and you have a point of view as well. And our point of view, I think, should be biblical. It should be, we should see everything through the lens of Scripture. Everything as it relates to our God and our Christ and our salvation. And so, uh, you know, in photography, I mean, this, this is probably an old slide. I shouldn't be using these things anymore. But, I, you know, I used to use uh, cameras quite a bit and uh, had a Nikon, an, uh, an F6 camera. It was a beautiful camera. But it was a single lens reflex, and uh, you could only do so much with it, but you could do a lot with it just by getting various filters. And by putting the filter over the lens, you could make different things happen. You could uh, colorize it in a way, diffuse the picture the way you wanted it to be. Uh, of course, none of this is necessary today with digital photography, but it was in those days. And it gives us some idea about the idea of point of view. And the fact is that we all have you know, a point of view. We put a, a lens over everything that we see. And that's why we have to be warned about historical revisionism, because they're now deciding that they're going to remove different things out of the history books, not teach kids any of these things any longer, and, uh, and uh, portray different people in the light that they want to portray them. And, uh, and this is a very dangerous aspect. And so you have to be very careful about history or what history is. I can remember a freshman at Pitt, there were, we had uh, uh, a lecturer, oh, he was dry, I mean, uh, um, boring. But uh, boy, he, he didn't even hide his point of view. And uh, he was disgusted with certain uh, historical presidents and he let it be known and, and so forth. Well, all he was trying to do was revise history, at least in our way of thinking, and because primitively we learned in elementary school and high school various things and we tended to lionize various people. And he was here to tear all of that down and to make sure that you uh, saw these people as being nothing but corrupt people and uh, not worthy of your respect. Uh, so that's what historical revisionism is about. One has to always be uh, listening to secular uh, sources with the jaundiced eye. In other words, weighing it all, whether it be true or false. You've got to understand what's the point of view and perspective. You know, it was a little while ago, but there was historical revisionism regarding the Holocaust. There are those today that believe it never happened. Uh, even though there's all sorts of evidence, uh, there are rejectors of that evidence. They don't care uh, how that evidence is propounded. Their belief is if you deny something long enough, that as generations pass by, and this was my father's point of view, having liberated a uh, concentration camp in Buchenwald in Germany, seeing it and taking pictures of it, uh, his fear was, and he told all of his children, you make sure you keep the story alive because he said there's going to come a day when they'll be denying that this ever happened. Well, we're living in that time. We've seen it happen, as a matter of fact. 
So uh, that's what's called revisionism. They want to eventually erase those kind of thoughts. Uh, and the Roman Catholics are doing this about the Inquisition. They want to pretend as though it never happened. Uh, they deny that there were thousands of Christians that were burned at the stake, tortured by monks to deny the faith. Priests that did this. They, they want to act like it didn't happen. Uh, so you have revisionist history, historians that come from Georgetown University, Catholic universities and so forth, writing new histories. Oh, there was an inquisition, but it was only about two or three hundred Protestants that were actually tortured. And that, that's how they look at it. And as a result, as time goes by, there'll be people who say, oh, that never happened. That never happened. And, and uh, so this is how, this is what we're left with. You know, it was a while back uh, at the turn of the century, the uh, Times uh, decided to make the person of the century. They wanted the person of the century, and that person who would better or for worse most influence the course of history over the past 100 years. Using the criteria, Times editors named the iconic and transforming scientist Albert Einstein as person of the century. They mistakenly opened the question to public input and found that after public voting was tallied, Jesus Christ was in the lead with 42% of the votes, almost 900,000 votes. Jesus' votes uh, were excluded because the candidate had to have lived in the last 100 years, so they had to qualify it. Because Jesus is the center of human history. He's the most important person of all human history. And so even though they want to revise things and change things and minimize the effect of the historicity of the Bible, uh, we're taught, of course, to uh, uphold and defend the faith. Uh, in archaeology, we understand, you know, the, the stones have a witness, don't they? All right, so I'm going to conclude with, is the Bible historically reliable? And uh, let me give you six E's that might uh, help you through this a little bit. So early testimony. So we have an early testimony that the Bible is historically accurate. And by that, I mean I'm speaking here of the writers of uh, the New Testament. You can see here the dates in which their epistles were written. And so these are all early testaments uh, to they saw Christ. Many of them were eyewitnesses. And, uh, and what they recorded, in other words, are things that they actually saw, that they aren't looking back and trying to record and assimilate information, but, or assemble in information, but instead that they actually were eyewitnesses and ear witnesses of the matter. So uh, the second would be eyewitnesses, as Luke tells us, even as they delivered them unto us, which were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Another scripture tells us, uh, the Peter speaking, we've not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In 1 John, John also writes, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have see, uh, seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Another E would be embarrassing testimony. So what is this about? Well, if you were going to uh, write uh, a fake fable and so forth, and uh, you were part of the character uh, in the account, you would leave out the bad stuff, wouldn't you? I mean, I would. If I was writing my own biography, I wouldn't want to put all the dumb things that I ever did. I mean, that would only be a page or two, but you know what I mean. We wouldn't, wa we wouldn't want to put that in. We w would intentionally bypass that. But you see, uh, and this will be a point that we make later on, which is the total honesty of the Scripture. Amen. That even Peter, Peter himself, uh, who uh, basically denies Christ, he says, uh, but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. Now who would put that in? You know, especially after you just received this accolade, thou art Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church, you know, heaven has blessed you and opened your eyes to this truth, you see. Uh, and then in the same breath, he's condemned, even called Satan. Uh, would you write that about yourself? You would want to overlook that, wouldn't you? To gloss over the bad parts that are embarrassing to you. Uh, the same could be said, certainly. Um, then began Peter to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. 
and immediately the cock crew. Now Peter is believed to be the actual mind behind the Gospel of Mark, that Mark was a mere amanuensis. That, in other words, he wrote what Peter told him. We can't really prove that one way or the other, but uh, Peter writes his own epistles. But we can understand that Peter would want this detail bypassed. Let's gloss over this. We don't want to talk about this uh, particularly. I mean, all the presidents have their libraries, don't they? You want to bet that uh, Bill Clinton doesn't have a, a, a section in his library devoted to his girlfriend? I don't think so. So, um, and uh, how about this in Mark 14, 50? They all forsook him and fled. Would you want to admit that? That you were cowardly when it came down to his death after you had just vowed that you would go to the cross with him? Not just Peter, but it says, and all of them said the same thing. And now the record is you didn't pay the vow. You ran away when he needed you the most. You wouldn't want to admit that. You'd be embarrassed to admit such a thing. And then in Luke, their words seemed like to them as idle tales. So when they were told of the resurrection, they didn't believe it. They thought you were just telling us a story. So I, in a sense, we can trust people that would actually tell their own faults publicly and know that it would be enshrined in the Word of God forever. Then there's the excruciating testimony. The fact that all these disciples that followed the Lord met with martyrdom deaths. Um, now some of these things uh, we can find in the scripture, but much of it, of course, is just according to uh, what we understand by the patristic writing, by those that were contemporary with the apostles that record how they met their deaths. So uh, it can't necessarily be validated the same way the scripture would be. Nonetheless, there are some records of uh, what happened to the twelve and to, to those who immediately followed. Then we have the expected testimony. Let's not forget that there's uh, well over 351 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in Jesus Christ alone. Uh, all of which would indicate again that what was said a thousand years before Christ was fulfilled in toto in the life of Jesus. Then we have the extra biblical testimonies, which we've already had looked at in the case of Tacitus and others. Ten non-Christian sources within. It's often argued that there's no evidence that corroborates that Jesus even lived, they'll say. And that's just not true. It's a lie. Uh, so we have these evidences. And let's remember again, when you go back and you're doing this study of um, a paleographic uh, uncoverings where we're looking back and we're trying to find ancient writings, you know, that are that are fragmented, that are dust in some cases because they're written on parchment, that uh, part of the pages are missing, whatever. It's extraordinary that we have any kind of a witness, but we do now, 2,000 years later, can still look at these writings and know that there were 10 non-Christian sources, 150 years within the life of Jesus, which corroborated what the New Testament asserts as a fact. So you can use those as uh, six proofs of the biblical historicity. Let's bow our heads. So Father, uh, I realize a lot of this content is uh, difficult to absorb. But here we are, Lord, uh, living in a very skeptical age. And the Bible is challenged on every side. And uh, we want to give what we can of a defense, Lord. And also, Lord, it gives us great certitude as we understand that we're not just reading, as Peter said, cunningly devised fables. We're actually reading the words of God. And that those words have been validated through uh, profane history and from hostile witnesses and uh, from those even that were extra biblical in a sense, Lord, that weren't necessarily hostile. We have the patristic writings. We have these things all pointing and, uh, and then we look at the bravery of those who in the first three centuries were willing to be fed to lions rather than deny the authority of the scripture. What a book we have indeed, Lord. So as we learned last week how valuable the book is to us, and now this week how accurate it is when we compare it to actual profane history, it gives us confidence, Lord, a proof that we have here the infallible, unchangeable word of God. So let us all believe it and let us live by its dictates, Lord, and let us rejoice in its truth all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come into my heart.